African Human Rights Commission, uh, which will today reveal whether EFF leader Julius Malema and other party members uh, are guilty of hate speech. Complaints against the EFF members include Malema's call in November, you'll recall, of 2016 for all land in South Africa to be returned to black people. He said at the time that the party was not calling for the slaughter of white people, quote unquote, at least for now. Well, let's take you to that commission right now. When we deal with issues that are brought to us for adjudication. <laughs> Further, in dealing with all complaints and in dealing with all investigations, including those investigations that the Commission does on its own accord, the Commission must be guided only by the Constitution and by the law. In addition, in performing our functions, we are required to be impartial and to perform our functions independently, as uh, you all know. The mandate of the Commission is to promote, protect, and monitor the observance of all rights. No right should therefore be protected or promoted in a way that negates other rights, which means that where it appears that there are two or more rights implicated in a case that the Commission is dealing with, a careful weighing and balancing of those rights aided by the facts of the case and the context needs to be done. In this case, we also have the right to free speech implicated. That needs also protection under our Constitution, while the Commission also protects dignity and the right to equality through the enforcement of the law against hate speech. In dealing with issues of hate speech, anyone interpreting or applying the provisions of the promotion of equality and prevention of unfair discrimination act, PEPUDA, is obliged to take into account the context of the dispute or complaint and the purpose of the act itself. This is the approach that the Commission has taken in considering the complaints lodged by various complainants against Mr. Malima. The Commission painstakingly considered each complaint, looking at the facts, the context, the applicable law, and the Constitution in the process. Our two legal officers, Dr. Chanel van der Berg, on the immediate left, and Mr. Osmond Ngomezulu, further on, will take you briefly through the process of the legal analysis, the process of analyzing the law and the facts. Hopefully this will highlight to you the current challenges in the law, including the jurisprudence relating to hate speech. On the basis of that analysis, and other considerations, the Commission came to the conclusion that while the ex forming the subject of these complaints may be quite offensive, they do not meet the legal threshold to qualify as hate speech. We took quite some time to consider these matters, the Malima matters, partly because the law itself in this regard is not yet crystal clear, and partly because we wanted to view and review the conclusions that the legal principles seemed to be compelling us towards. We note that various equality court decisions do not have unanimity on how to interpret the provisions of Section 10 of PEPUDA, which seems to indicate that this is still a developing area of the law. The matter is now destined for the Constitutional Court, as you may know, and the Commission hopes that a significant measure of clarity will be added to this issue. The legislature itself is still grappling with the issue. The Department of Justice has repeatedly told us that they are in the process of reviewing and amending the equality law, PEPUDA. The hate speech bill is still on the road to approval by Parliament. In this regard, 
We even went out and sought the legal opinion of one of the top advocates in the country because we did not want to exclude the possibility that there might perhaps be another way of looking at the facts and interpreting the law applicable in these cases. To our pleasant surprise, that senior counsel's legal opinion also took the same view we were taking internally. One must mention here that in requesting the outside legal opinion, we did not reveal to the senior counsel that we already had an internal opinion, nor did we share that opinion with the legal counsel. Uh, I must add that this decision of the, commissioner, of the commission does not exonerate Mr. Malima for other acts that may be the subject of hate speech or a violation of other rights. Even though the finding is that it does not amount to hate speech this time, his utterances are, quite, are still quite problematic to us in a society, in a democratic society, sorry, that is committed to healing the divisions of the past and establishing a society based on democratic values and fundamental freedoms. Beyond our technical legal findings in terms of the rule of law, the Commission has already committed to taking forward dialogue in the promotion of social cohesion and the elimination of intolerance and prejudice as envisaged by the National Development Plan and the recently um, approved and publicized National Action Plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Could I ask everyone to please put their phone on silent if possible and switch them off? Um, okay, so we're going to move on. <clears throat> Dr. Van der Berg and Mr. Gomez will now take us through the, the factual finding. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairperson. Can I just stop you? Do you does the yes. member of the media just want a moment to move your microphones? Yes. Shall we move them for you? Let's just do this. Sorry, Chanel. Thank you. This is this. Okay. So is this going to be? There you go. Okay. Sorry. You go. So as Chairperson indicated, there is a lot of uncertainty regarding the law of hate speech in our country right now. We've got various contradictory high court or equality court precedents that each take a different approach to the question of hate speech and their interpretation of Section 10 of the Equality Act in the light of the Constitution. Our Constitution is founded on the values of equality, human dignity, and freedom. The right to equality is also guaranteed in Section 9, and the right to freedom of expression is guaranteed in Section 16.1 of the Constitution. The value of human dignity informs both the rights to equality and the right to freedom of expression. In DA versus ANC, the Constitutional Court said that freedom of expression has both intrinsic and instrumental value and is central to human agency and dignity. The right is instrumentally important for its ability to encourage open debate. According to the court, quote, if society represses views it considers unacceptable, they may never be exposed as wrong. Open debate enhances truth-finding and enables us to scrutinize political argument and deliberate social values." Unquote. In State versus Mamambolo, the Constitutional Court again emphasized the importance of the right to freedom of expression given our recent past of thought control and censorship and enforced conformity with government's theories. The court went on to caution that we should not succumb to any form of thought control, however respectably dressed. In De Rierk, this is Director of Public Prosecutions, the Constitutional Court endorsed an approach whereby even expression that shocks, offends, or disturbs <coughs> should enjoy constitutional protection. <coughs> however, freedom of expression is not a paramount right. It needs to be balanced against both the rights to human dignity and the right to equality. Whereas robust political speech is central to the right of freedom of expression, other types of expression may hold less societal value and can therefore be more easily just and justifiably limited. 
The right to freedom of expression that's guaranteed in Section 16.1 of the Constitution does not extend to certain harmful types of expression. The types of harmful expression defined in Section 16.2 of the Constitution are those types that may adversely affect the dignity of others. Section 16.2, therefore, does not protect propaganda for war, incitement of imminent violence, or, importantly, the advocacy of hatred that is based on race, ethnicity, gender, or religion, and that constitutes the incitement to cause harm. It's important to note here that the Constitution does not prohibit these types of expression. It merely does not um, protect them. That means that within that narrow definition in the Constitution, government is free to regulate those forms of expression without having to justify it in terms of the Section 36 limitations analysis in the Constitution. However, as soon as we be move beyond those narrow definitions, for example, propaganda for war or advocacy of hatred that also constitute incitement to cause harm, we go within the ambit of the protected right to freedom of expression. This does not mean we can allow all forms of expression, but we need to limit it in terms of our constitution, as is required by, of course, the rule of law. Now, hatred connotes an extreme emotion of detestation and um, severe ill will, while advocacy implies promoting or making a case for hatred. In the constitution, Advocacy of hatred must be based on a closed list of only four <coughs> grounds. And hate speech based on, for example, sexual orientation or nationality would still enjoy protection under Section 16.1. But would then, if we limit those forms of expression, it would have to be limited in terms of the limitations analysis in Section 36 of the Constitution. So in order to fall outside the scope of constitutional protection, Hate speech must both constitute advocacy of hatred on a listed ground and incitement to cause harm. The Commission has held in a previous appeal decision that harm includes physical, psychological, and emotional harm. Now, Section 10 of the Equality Act prohibits hate speech while significantly extending the boundaries of the excluded forms of expression listed in Section 16.2 of the Constitution. The provision reads, subject to the proviso in section 12, no person may publish, propagate, advocate, or communicate words based on one or more of the prohibited grounds against any person that could reasonably be construed to demonstrate a clear intention to be hurtful, be harmful, or to incite harm, promote, or propagate hatred. Section 10 of Pupudal, the Equality Act, is therefore different from Section 16.2 of the Constitution in several ways. First of all, Section 10 prohibits hate speech, whereas 16.2 of the Constitution merely excludes it from constitutional protection. Secondly, the constitutional definition of hate speech is limited to the grounds of race, ethnicity, gender, and religion. In contrast, Section 10 is much broader and refers to a whole host of prohibited grounds. And this would include grounds where we've seen patterns of discrimination and persecution, like sexual orientation or nationality. Finally, for the expression to be excluded from constitutional protection, it must be advocacy of hatred and incitement to cause harm. There's a much lower threshold in Section 10 of Papuda in that speech can be hurtful, harmful, incite harm, and promote or propagate hatred. One immediately notes the word hurtful is not to be found in the Constitution. And this raises the risk um, that the threshold for hate speech has been significantly lowered by Section 10 of the Equality Act. Section 10 may be read as an attempt to prohibit all forms of discriminatory speech, but this is in fact done by another provision, Section 12, in the Equality Act. It is therefore very important to implement and interpret Section 10 of the Equality Act in a manner that does not unjustifiably <coughs> limit the right to freedom of expression that is guaranteed to all people in this country. To the extent that Section 10 
extends the boundaries of hate speech as understood in the Constitution and sets a lower threshold for hate speech. It needs to be reasonable and justifiable in an open and democratic society based on freedom, dignity, and equality, and taking into account various factors that are set out in Section 36 of the Constitution. One of the factors is the importance of the purpose of the limitation, so why is Section 10 of the Equality Act important in prohibiting hate speech, and whether there are less restrictive means to achieve this purpose. Now, the objects of the, of the Equality Act are manifold, and it includes giving effect to the letter and spirit of the Constitution, in particular, the prohibition of advocacy of hatred that constitutes incitement to cause harm, as contemplated in Section 16.2c of the Constitution. To the extent that Section 10 goes beyond hate speech as constitutionally defined, it must therefore be justified. And here, a possible point of contention could be that a less restrictive means could have been employed in drafting Section 10. For example, this could be employed by putting the word and between each of those subsections.